Okay, so we have lumber, we have slaves, we have ceramics and bronze. How complicated could this really be? Let's take a look at how widespread trade was in the ancient West real quick. Uh, one great example is the North African jungle elephant. It might sound a little weird because today it doesn't exist, right? Well, the African elephants that Hannibal would have used in his approach towards Rome were not the sub-Saharan um, African elephant that we know today. They were not the Indian elephant. They were another elephant, which is now extinct. This was the North African jungle elephant. Do you want to take a guess as to why it no longer exists? That's because there is no longer a North African jungle the way that there used to be. These were very thick, sturdy, old trees that were cut down because they could yield large planks for making large boats. This whole environment, including this large animal and probably a whole lot of others, were wiped out about 2,000 years ago or so um, for the uh, raw materials that they wanted there. So how widespread was trade? It was widespread enough for people to actively change a fifth of a continent at a time when bronze tools were being used. Much of the Levant was a very different climate than it is today at this time as well. I talked a little bit about this with the cedars of Lebanon, but I want to go a little bit more in depth on that. So these trees in this environment were very old. Um, the trees were huge. Uh, I'll throw some pictures up of some of the ones that still exist today. and. They could hold a lot of soil in place. Um, so soil is basically made up of two or three important parts. You have the foliage on top, you have the top soil, and then you have the kind of loam, and then the dirt and the, the bottom soils that aren't really all that important. You really want the top couple of layers for your crops. The thing is, um, working the land too hard or uh, soil erosion from the wind can remove this top layer, making the soil more barren. As these plants were cut down, the wind was allowed to drag across the soil, the soil was made infertile, and people moved on through f further wind erosion, since all of these areas are very close to the sea. Um, these areas became much less fertile and a lot of plants then couldn't grow so because of all the plants that had been ch uh, cut down and because the area wasn't properly taken care of it became more barren and then to add to that there was these large deserts surrounding them now just real quick i want to take a look at the idea of the dust bowl in the midwest in the united states scrapes of wrath all of that and this land was farmed too hard and then there was some intense wind. Um, I'm going to be kind of going through this pretty quickly because this isn't a huge example, but it is a relevant example. And all the topsoil was lost. And all of these Midwestern farmers now had to move west to more fertile soil since this had all become barren. So this shows that this idea can happen in the Bronze Age. This happened on a much grander scale over a much longer amount of time. Because Bronze Age farming techniques were so rudimentary um a lot of land was used something like 80 percent of the land that was ever farmed in britain was farmed during the bronze age and then we became much better at using which land we needed to but a lot of that bronze age land was forever lost because of terrible farming practices terrible logging practices and it's actually kind of interesting because once they started to run out of these trees to turn into ships they no longer had the ships to supply their trade so their whole society kind of collapsed as they destroyed the environment around them. So I say again, we think of modern people as being the most environmentally destructive, but in reality I would say the Bronze Age people probably had the best plan for destroying the areas around them. Um, and then one other thing I wanted to look at for how widespread trade was, uh, a little bit more positive. <laughs> I guess you could say, 
was the um, Hellenic coins from the Hellenistic period, about 300 BC to about 0 AD, um, can be found from Greece to Afghanistan. Now, they used similar types of coins, and the, um, uh, man, I want to say denarii, but I know that's not right. I'll throw that up later. Um, the coinage that they used was very safe, and so it facilitated trade. One of the basic needs of money is to be able to facilitate trade, and if you can't do that properly, then something like the Silk Road can't really happen. So when you see a lot of these coins appearing in such a wide area, you know that there was an effective trade and transfer of wealth going on between the different countries there. Now, the same can be said for ceramics, which would have been used to house a lot of the goods that were traded. And as trade solidifies, um, we began to see certain solid trade structures in addition to uh, the Silk Road. I wouldn't necessarily call the slave trades part of the Silk Road, but as the Silk Road became more of a solid idea in the transfer of goods and wealth from the Occident to the Orient, you also begin to see the solidification of the Roman and then Islamic and then triangle slave trades. So to, wide, uh, to recap, how widespread was trade? It was widespread enough to affect the environment pretty radically, widespread enough to leave remnants of trade and wealth on uh, about a third of the Asian continent and a lot of Europe and Africa. And it was powerful enough to solidify trade routes that would exist for thousands of years. Okay, so I want to take a look at a couple of some major exchanges that happened from Orient to Occident um, to sort of explain how the Silk Road started, because even though it's called the Silk Road, that was one of the more important products later, but it wasn't exactly the number one thing that was traded across the entire area and as it started out it was really more of a way of agricultural and uh, rudimentary practices to spread between different cultures because that's what they needed in the Bronze Age they needed methods for growing crops a lot more than they needed methods for looking fancy so one really interesting one is the development of citrus so Citrus is, you know, lemons, limes, and oranges. If you speak English, like I obviously do, we have those three words, lemon, lime, and orange. It's interesting because these all come from the same plant. And if you speak a different language, like Portuguese or Spanish, they have the word citrus, and then they refer to it as green or yellow or orange. That's because they're all technically the same thing. There's a lot of innovation as I spoke of that came out of these trades and part of that was agricultural practices. If you wanted something that grew a thousand miles away, it might not just be able to uproot it and move it. So you had to figure out how to best get it there and what the best way to have it take form was. Um, citrus came to the Mediterranean Basin around 2000 years ago, so around 0 AD. Before then it was pretty scarce and it would have been an extremely valuable item in the European and North African world. Um, another really interesting thing like that is the development of what's called mustard green, which was eventually cultivated into cauliflower and broccoli and Brussels sprouts and a couple other plants that we know of today that we might not consider as all technically being the same plant. Um, another thing would be dogs. They all came from the same one species, and today you can get them in a lot of different uh, variations. Um, in ancient Roman times, there were three types of dog, hunting, war, and uh, farming, or sort of pastoral, I guess would be a better way to put it. And today, there are hundreds. It's kind of gotten out of uh, hand. But um, another really kind of important idea that was passed along that you can see was shipbuilding. So the ancient Egyptians had these great ships that they needed to transfer large amounts of copper and tin. Um, this idea was reworked and reevaluated by the Phoenicians, and because Egypt had launching sites for ships in both the Mediterranean and the Red Sea, once they had passed these along the uh, Silk Road, 
they could begin to set up trade in the Persian Gulf, which would eventually lead to direct routes from the Persian Gulf to the Indian Ocean, which was another sort of stepping stone for the Silk Road. So the agricultural practices from east to west and the manufacturing processes from west to east were sort of an important idea at this time, although they weren't exactly the rule, you could say. Um, Agricultural practices, as I said before, were very important. Somewhere like Egypt, where it flooded eight months out of the year, um, ideas like irrigation were important, but they weren't the same as in somewhere like Sumer. So if you were a peasant farmer trying to improve your yield, you would have more practice with innovating something like water working in an area like Sumer or Mesopotamia in general than you would in a place like Egypt. So these irrigation practices which were better and the two field crop system and a couple other minor innovations in agriculture which were all better came from different areas and spread out because they were superior ideas rather than because they were local to that area so a lot of the major exchanges from occident to orient and vice versa were sort of hard to see today because at the beginning they were all necessary and there were those sort of ideas that once you see it, you go, oh, well, yeah, of course we're going to farm this way. Of course we're going to irrigate this way. This would sort of develop as it went along, but I think that at least in the early stage, one of the best ways to divide the major exchanges are the new products arriving from the east and the manufactured products coming out of the west. So, to conclude... Why was the Silk Road important to the early Bronze Age in the Occident? Uh, ideas, cultures, and practices could compete in a common area uh, along various different peoples and nations without necessarily having to be warfare. This was important because different ideas could build off of each other rather than wholesale replacing each other, and it allowed for a lot of innovation, especially in art and science and astronomy and other fields like that, to flower in a way that wouldn't really be seen for a long time. Uh, trade is very different from war in that it's not a zero-sum game. So zero sum means that in order for you to gain a slice of that pie, someone else has to lose a slice of that pie. With trade, if you can produce more and move it further, you can generate more wealth, but only if there's other people that are doing about the same thing. Trade needs various nations and various peoples to interact with each other and to innovate upon their own and other ideas so that they can expand and they can produce more and they can increase. Um, there's another very important aspect to this trade and this development because they needed to help each other in protecting trade routes and defensive alliances and things like that. There was a certain element of preservation of knowledge and innovation. So ancient Egypt and um, Sumeria and different countries like that did tend to collapse and fail fairly often, but as we started to exit the Bronze Age and a lot of these trade routes were solidified, they would continue beyond the powerful societies collapsing. This is because the less powerful and the less influential societies could see and interact with the major powers and try to ape the behaviors that got them there in the first place. If you're one nation not interacting with anyone else and you're all alone and something happens and you collapse, all of the progress and all of the knowledge that you have will be lost. This isn't true in the case of a major player in a major trade route. The Silk Road was very important for mostly developmental and innovative reasons. The thing is, uh, the Silk Road also required a large area and a lot of different people participating in it to really be effective. Because of the scarcity uh, aspect, the further you could move goods, the more you could make. When the Silk Road started to get narrowed down, especially by the Turks removing the Byzantines, um, they sort of cut out the European market. 
so there was less distance that could be traveled overall and there was still a desire for these products so a lot of Europeans rather than paying the exorbitantly high prices the Turks demanded sailed west and they found new ways and new trade routes and the Silk Road sort of stagnated for a while um, it has always been one of the most important paths in the world as you can see from US and Russian and USSR and Chinese and British and Russian Imperial and all of these other different nations that have been fighting over this area since time immemorial but the cumulative power of any trade route is the distance that can be covered, the amount of time that it takes to go, and the safety of that trade route. The bigger, the longer, and the safer the Silk Road was, the more powerful all of those countries involved in it could become. Um, thank you very much for watching this video. This was my attempt at a shorter video. Like I said, I'm pretty sick. And I, I don't really feel that good right now, but um, I wanted to get something out today. Uh, next week we will have episode 7. It's going to be on the Age of Sail and leading into the Enlightenment times. I think we're mostly going to be taking a look at Austria and probably a little bit at France. Um, they're just good anchors to each other. And we will wrap that up then. Uh, that will be our first turn of the cycle. This is the new series that I'm hoping I'm going to be able to put out every Sunday. So we should have new content out on Sundays and Tuesdays. Um, if you liked this video, please let me know, leave a comment or a like, uh, share it with your friends. Um, if there's anything in specific you'd like to see or you'd like to know more about, you can let me know that as well. Um, so, thank you very much for watching, and until next time, remember, Av Imperator.